Like many Americans, Tony Viliotti unknowingly spent years of his life heading down a dangerous track. One that paved the way for a series of major health problems that took him by surprise and almost took his life. I was first diagnosed with fatty liver, non-alcoholic non fatty liver, in 2005. Uh, at the time, the doctor, you know, it didn't seem to be a big deal. The doctor, you know, the doctor told me I, that I had elevated liver enzymes, which indicated a fatty liver. And he said I, sh I should lose some weight, but it didn't make a big deal of it. Well, I had, I had heard, I'd been told to lose weight every doctor's appointment I'd ever, ever, ever been to in my life. So it really didn't sink in and this was something I had to worry about. It really is a silent ep epidemic. People have no clue. And I go on these blogs and I read, and it's the same story over and over again. Well, I had no idea. I had a fatty liver. I was told to lose weight. Everyone says the same thing. And then, after so long, they next thing they know, they need a transplant. They have cirrhosis. What Tony initially didn't know, what his wife Betsy and family didn't know, and what millions of Americans don't know, is that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is on the rise. 100 million Americans have it, and most don't even know it. It's not caused by alcohol or drinking. It is a quiet ticking time bomb with ties to our American diet and lifestyle. It's only been about 20, 25 years that we've recognized how important fatty liver disease is. Uh, we're not quite sure why that is, why that's happened in the last 25 years, but we're seeing much more of that. And we're starting to see now that the cases can be so varied. Some can take years to develop to liver disease. Others take a very short period of time. And, and in those patients, I think it, it is a huge shock to them. To understand this growing health epidemic, it's important to understand what the liver does. Located just under the rib cage on the right side of the body, the liver is the body's largest internal organ. It has over 500 different functions. Everything you consume goes through your liver, either to be made into something useful, like nutrients, or the liver steps in to act like a waste disposal system, filtering out toxins. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, occurs when fat accumulates in a person's liver, and it's not due to alcohol or drinking. When this fat builds up and then gets inflamed, it's known as NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, a condition often undetected until it's far advanced. When you go to the physicians a lot of times and you're not feeling well and you go to your general practitioner, they will check you for thyroid, they will check you for diabetes, they will check you for a number of conditions. Not all doctors will do liver function numbers to see what, what is going on with your liver. Left undetected, untreated, and with few to no symptoms, inflammation and liver cell damage from NASH can cause fibrosis or scarring of the liver. Eventually, the road may lead patients to cirrhosis or liver cancer and the need for a life-saving liver transplant. It's a continuing problem because people don't know about it, and that includes doctors and medical personnel. So, you know, that's why it's called a silent epidemic. Hey, Tony Viliotti's Nash journey can be traced back to childhood. I was raised in a large Italian family. Holidays, weekends, special events, and even not so special events, all revolved around food. We were always encouraged to eat. I don't speak Italian, but one of the first words I learned was manja manja, which is eat in Italian. And my mother always encouraged us to eat. Her philosophy was that a healthy child has a healthy appetite. Tony's eating habits continued through his high school years. More pasta, more red meat, mountains of sugar and fast food, and more pounds. When I went away to college, of course, you know, my mother wasn't in the kitchen, so I didn't, uh, you know, my food consumption dropped significantly. I didn't, A, she wasn't there, and B, I didn't have the money to go out and buy food. So I actually lost a fair amount of weight while I was in college. But then came graduation and marriage, a career and a family. I got married in 1978, and after that, I had a job where I worked 60 to 70 hours a week, and then kids came along after marriage, and I, I just didn't take the time to exercise, and my eating habits were terrible. You know, I, I stopped every morning and had a chocolate milkshake for breakfast, you know, along with a breakfast sandwich, 
And so that was just indicative of the kind of uh, the diet I followed. In 1988, Tony was diagnosed with diabetes. In 2005, diabetic and obese, weighing 280 pounds, Tony was diagnosed with a fatty liver. You know, actually, I did lose some weight uh, after he told me that. I actually, I actually lost about 50 pounds. But unfortunately, I gained it all back over time. Of the 100 million Americans who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, up to 25 million have NASH. The risk factors, one or more of the following. Obesity, especially with a large waist size. High blood pressure. High levels of triglycerides or abnormal levels of cholesterol in the blood. Type 2 diabetes. Sleep apnea. Metabolic syndrome. Caught early, liver disease can be reversible. Caught too late, the chain of medical events can be deadly. Well, um, you're uh, gambling. That's all I can tell you. Um, as much as it, as not everybody progresses to NAFLD or NASH or even cirrhosis, we have not yet identified specific markers where we can tell who's at risk and who's not. And until we do so, everybody that meets the criteria we discussed throughout this interview is at risk. So if you're not taking seriously, it's just like playing the Russian roulette. And I don't believe that that is a, um, a good approach when it comes to your own health or your life. For Tony, 2014 brought life-changing news, a diagnosis of both NASH and cirrhosis. When we got that phone call in uh, 2014, and the doctor said, oh, there's a little something on your scan that looks like you could have cirrhosis. Well, I just laughed. I said, he called the wrong person. You don't have cirrhosis. I said, there's no way. I said, if you drink 10 glasses of wine in a year, that's a big year for you. Like everyone else on the planet, I thought the only way you got cirrhosis was through drinking. I thought he was mistaken. So did my wife, so did my friends. You know, they never heard of non-alcoholic liver cirrhosis, but, um, uh, at that point, uh, uh, my doctor, my uh, general practitioner, referred me to a specialist hepatologist at, at Allegheny General Hospital. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think that was the beginning of the worrying all the time. What's this test mean? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? But that was probably the beginning of the first time I really felt nervous and worried, and is he going to come out of this okay? Uh, then in, uh, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, in 2017, I had a doctor's appointment. I just recently had an MRI, and they were concerned about the results. So I went to the appointment, and, and the doctor told me I had cancer, liver cancer. Uh, and this, this was the first time that, that ever occurred to me that this was really a serious deal. And that, you know, th at that point, I had two choices. Either I was going to get a transplant, or I was going to die. Um, and obviously that, that catches your attention. Usually when we receive these uh, transplant patients, they've gone through and seen a gastroenterologist or a liver specialist, a hepatologist. And so most of them have an idea of what's going on. Now it's still highly stressful. It's still something sudden, you know, it's not every day that you hear, oh, you need a liver transplant. And so there's always uh, an air of shock to the whole process. As Tony's need for a transplant grew, his condition grew even worse. After extensive testing and evaluation, he went on the waiting list for a liver transplant in June 2017. By October, Tony's family knew he was running out of time. The best way that I can really describe it is like he was like a shell of himself. Like it was still my dad, you could see his personality there, but there was something else there that was kind of like this wall in between like who he was like inside and who he was like starting to become because of this disease. County Medic 742. 742 bed. As he waited for a liver transplant, five trips to the emergency room followed as Tony's liver struggled to work and keep him alive. Well, the first time he went to the emergency room, I was just shocked. I came home from church and he was standing in our bedroom with his hands on the wall like this, like. He's trying to push the wall out of the way. Why can't I walk? And he's pushing and pushing. And finally, he was so confused, he didn't even know who I was. Come on, huh? Let's go downstairs. Come on. I got him down to another bedroom. And he sat there, and he was 
like rocking back and forth and he's like tapping his head and hitting his chin and, and I would say take some water push my hand away no you can't no and Tony never does anything like that with me I mean that's just not him that's not his personality at all and he was like push my arm away no no and eventually I called the paramedics one, two, two three. three. What Tony was experiencing was eventually diagnosed as hepatic encephalopathy, the loss of brain function when a damaged liver doesn't remove toxins from the blood. It turned out I had hepatic encephalopathy, which is a result of the liver deteriorating to the point where it can't process the protein that I was ingesting into my body. So ordinarily the liver will remove toxins from the food you ingest, but my liver had reached a point where it couldn't do that. So that resulted in ammonia going into my bloodstream and reaching my brain. If my wife wouldn't have been home that day, there's no telling what would have happened. Uh, you know, the worst case is you'd go into a coma. I couldn't believe what was happening, and I didn't think my husband would believe me. I didn't know if maybe the doctor should see this. So I wanted a video so first my husband would understand what was going on to the doctors and then maybe my children if they really wanted to see. But I, And maybe just proof for myself because afterwards you think, oh, it wasn't that bad, but it was. He was a CPA, an accountant. He, my mom would ask him, what's three times nine? Simple, 27. I mean, it, you don't have to think about it. It's just he didn't know. And I asked him, I said, what are, you, like, what are you trying to do to figure it out? And he said, I don't even know where to start. Yeah, later that night, I woke up and didn't know where I was, didn't know the year, didn't know anything. In the hospital, they gave me medication and so forth. And eventually, I was able to go home after five days. And my memory was back. But my brain was still foggy. From that point forward, I, I would say I was sick. Well, October 21st, I wasn't sick. October 22nd, I was sick. And you know, that carried through the transplant. Tony would remain on the transplant waiting list for nine months. The wait was excruciating. I told people it was like being pregnant without a due date. And ironically, it turned out I was called for the transplant almost exactly nine months after I was put on the waiting list. We had five weddings that summer. I bought the black dress because our, our anniversary was going to be that summer too. I didn't think we'd make it. And I bought a black dress that I could wear in any situation. And I, I, I just, I really didn't think we'd make our 40th anniversary. The outcome of Tony's long medical journey still to come, along with steps each of us can take to avoid going down the same path. But first, a look at how widespread, how varied, and how very devastating the cases can be as we learn more about silent epidemic, the liver disease, NASH. In the small Pennsylvania town of Mather, Tazo. come here. Bonnie Smitley almost became another liver disease statistic. I felt like I was slowly dying, and I was awake for it. This is Bonnie today. This was Bonnie in 2017, full of fluid or ascites, as she battled cirrhosis and waited desperately for a life-saving liver transplant. I felt like I was pregnant and well overdue to give birth. Yes, so full. You couldn't eat because you felt you had that fullness on you anyhow. And sometimes it was hard to breathe because it felt like it was putting pressure up on your lungs. Bonnie's medical journey began in 2014 when a doctor ready to remove her gallbladder found a much more serious problem with her liver. I had a lot of um, nausea and some vomiting. Bonnie was first diagnosed with NASH and eventually cirrhosis. I started getting um, like these spells where I couldn't see and I would get confused. And that's when I, I quit driving. I didn't trust myself to drive anymore. I was um, starting to fall. I had frequent falls. 
wasn't right in the head. She'd come up with all kinds of weird things. Like, she'd want to take her car the one time to go through the car wash, and she kept saying, I'm taking my car through the laundromat. I'm like, what in the world are you trying to say? And it was just like a puzzle game sitting there trying to figure out what she wanted or what she wanted to do. And then I was actually, towards the end, I was like scared to wake up in the morning so I didn't know if she was going to be still breathing. In July 2017, Bonnie went on the liver transplant list. By then so very sick, she barely made it to a fundraiser held to help her. It started like at 11 and I don't think I even made it to her till like 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I couldn't barely get there. Ten hours of transplant surgery, 75 days in the hospital, gave Bonnie time to think about so much, including the deceased organ donor, whose liver gave her another chance at life. There's not enough to say to a person. Um, I get emotional about it all the time. It's hard to thank somebody for something that's... They gave her life for her. You know, some, they, somebody lost somebody. And I got to live. It almost makes you feel guilty sometimes. But then, you know, I know that was their wish to be an organ donor. But you still feel sad for that family. <clears throat> but I'm trying to take good care of it for her. Yeah. The hole that is in all of our hearts is just immeasurable. It's awful. And he was 61 years old when he passed away. In Erie, Pennsylvania, Robert Sambroke Jr. had everything to live for. The Pittsburgh native had a loving family, a seat as a county judge, and it seemed his health. My brother-in-law was in a position, you know, he finally had his dream job, if you will. He loved, loved, loved what he did. He was helping people left and right where he was, was working. He and my sister have seven gorgeous, wonderful grandkids, and they, are, they were the light of his life. A diagnosis of NASH seven years before his death set off no major alarms, and according to his family, triggered no counseling on diet, weight loss, or liver disease. That was the hardest thing for Bob to believe, that he was sick. He didn't feel sick. He didn't look sick. Doctors didn't make a big deal. So why should he worry about it? The worry didn't begin until 2016, when Bob was admitted to his local hospital with congestive heart failure that was traced to a liver issue which caused fluid to build up around his heart. Within a year, he would be diagnosed with cirrhosis and finally terminal cancer, a complicated liver tumor with many blood vessels. Any chance of a transplant was over. He should have had so much more life ahead of him and his family should have had him so much longer. We all should have just had so much more time with him. Every day is full of tears and every night is full of tears. It really is. On a cold day, Patty Wilberg and neighbor Betsy Villiotti compared notes of life and loss, knowing that so much more needs to be done to save more family, more friends, more loved ones from a silent epidemic. But I do think that the doctors need to make sure that they express to the patient, you know, this. This disease doesn't sound awful yet, and you feel good so far, but if you don't make changes now and really work towards improving certain aspects of your lifestyle, you're gonna need, at best, you're gonna need a transplant, and at worst, a transplant isn't gonna be enough.
It's now a year since Tony Viliotti's long journey took him from life-threatening liver disease patient to survivor of a liver transplant. This is the best uh, I felt in at least 15 years. Compared to how I felt uh, before the transplant, I was on an emotional roller coaster. You went from highs to lows. When it was low, I actually wrote my obituary. Yeah, I wrote a letter, I, I started writing letters to my kids to be open when I died. On the day after St. Patrick's Day 2018, Tony underwent a successful six-hour operation at Allegheny General Hospital, followed by months of close monitoring and rehabilitation. We call them every day post-transplant. We talk to them every day. And as they get better, it's somewhat sad for us because we miss talking to them every day. And there comes a point where you call them and they are not home because they're out and they're living their lives and you're very happy for them on one end, and then when they call you on the other end, you're so happy because you haven't talked to your friend in quite a while. Sophia, do you have a five? Thank you. Tony's recovery has had him making the most out of the many cards he's been dealt in life. He also chooses wisely. With the help of his wife, Betsy, Tony's sticking with a mostly Mediterranean diet. He's managing his diabetes, taking anti-rejection drugs, and getting daily exercise. Well, he's highly motivated. And, and you know, you, you can never underestimate patient motivation. That, that, that is a very important factor in the recovery. He was very good about taking care of himself so that when he was on the list, he did as much as he could to make sure that he was in good health, make sure that he kept up his strength. And then he was highly motivated after the transplant to get himself better. And so um, he only stayed in the hospital for about nine days. Usually it's about three weeks. And if you look at him today, you wouldn't know that he had a liver transplant. Tony's telling his story across the country. He started a foundation to educate people young and old about fatty liver disease and has made new friends. I didn't become interested in liver disease. I became a victim of liver disease. Wayne Eskridge started the Fatty Liver Foundation, which advocates early liver screening for America's skyrocketing high-risk population. We do colonoscopies and mammographies and high blood pressure, and we test for glaucoma, and we test for everything under the sun. But we don't screen for liver disease. We patiently wait until it gets to cirrhosis, which is a terminal diagnosis for most people. One of the main emphasis of the Fatty Liver Foundation is that we are promoting screening of liver patients, and to that end, we've created a uh, clinical trial using a fiber scan, which is the way to measure liver fat and stiffness for people that don't yet have the clinical disease. And so we're running that in Houston today as a um, demonstration project for our goal to deploy 400 screening centers across the United States. If we are successful at that, we'll screen a million patients a year. Currently, there are no drugs that address NASH or cirrhosis, but several are in the testing phase and may soon be on the market. So for now, the best prescription to treat the silent epidemic remains increased awareness at all levels and making lifestyle changes, including exercise and cutting out carbonated beverages, refined sugars, artificial flavors and alcohol, and processed foods. I think the more people hear about this, they're gonna, the more aware they're going to be, and then they'll start implementing some of these changes. You just need to hear it a lot. It's a, it, it's a cultural change, if you like. It, it may take many generations for this to change. We got to start somewhere, might as well start here and today. It's just a miracle, because we're just happy to be living our life and celebrating and picking up where we left off and enjoying being with the grandkids, enjoying taking little vacations or a weekend here or a weekend there and irritating each other like we sometimes do. <laughs> but, you know, Tony and I look at each other and we say, you know, sometimes we have bad days, but even a bad day is a good day because of all we've been through, it, it really doesn't matter. Because I received the gift of life, and I, I think it is a gift. 
I just think I have an obligation to do something positive with the rest of my days on Earth. And the person I want to reach is me in 2005. Make them aware of what can happen if you don't pay attention to the warning signs. So that's the message. Be aware and take action. Thank you.